It is my honor to be here today after my professors. Thanks to Professor Dr. Muhammad Nasser Sheikh. Thanks to Professor Dr. Hassan Shuif for their continuous support. I will speak today about traumatic facial palsy, either accidental or iatrogenic. First of all, I will start with a case scenario just for brainstorming. If you are in the emergency room and you faced with a patient like that, with right facial palsy after trauma, recent trauma in just today, and the patient came with you for you with this picture, the right side facial palsy, what is your next step? Is this patient indication for surgery or just for conservation? Is this patient just to leave the patient to go home or what is your next step? And what about this patient? Is this patient similar to the previous one with left facial palsy? Is this patient is similar or different from the previous one? And what about this panic? Patient after surgery and immediately after surgery when the patient get for out from the OR and you go to examine the patient and you find the patient with left side facial palsy. Is this panic for you or just to wait or just to do surgery again? What is your next step? I think all of us faced with a patient like that, even traumatic or atogenic. And what is your next step? To, to speak about the management, there is some histological background. I just want to give a short brief about that and give some brief about electrodiagnostic test. As Professor Dr. Hisham said, the facial nerve consists of axons. Each axon covered with Schwann, covered with Schwann cell, and the axon is covered by endoneurium. Axons together form a fascicle, and the fascicle is covered by perineurium, and the whole facial nerve fiber is covered by epineurium. In some cases, just the axon will be cut. In other cases, the axon and endoneurium will be cut. And other cases, the axon in the neurium and the neurium, and sometimes complete transection. So, Sunnerland do a classification for that. It is the most accepted classification. The first degree is just nerve block, just conduction block. All the nerve fiber is intact, but was just a conduction block. The second degree is axonal discontinuity, axonal degeneration, was intact. In unurium, bionurium, and ebonurium. The third degree is axon and endonurium disruption. The fourth degree is fascicular disruption, axon, endonurium, and bionurium. The fifth degree is complete transection of the nerve. Again, what is the value of that? What is the value to know it is conduction block or axon discontinuity or neurotimesis or axonotimesis? The value of that is the neurobraxia the axon is intact, so the nerve can conduct electrical stimulation evoked externally, and there will be no degeneration. But in axonotemesis and in neurotemesis, the axon is disrupted, so there will be no conduction of electrical stimulation from outside, and there will be Wallerian degeneration. And since there will be degeneration, there will be regeneration. During regeneration, there will be synkinesis which is a bit regeneration. Fibers going to the eye will go to the mouth, and the fibers go to the mouth will go to the eye. Again, what is the value for differentiation between neuropraxia, axonotemesis, and neurotemesis? It is for sure proved that patient with just neuropraxia carry a very good prognosis for spontaneous prognosis. And cases with axonotemesis carry a good, a good prognosis for spontaneous recovery. And the cases with neurotemesis or complete nerve transaction carry very poor prognosis for spontaneous recovery. So if I have a tool to differentiate between neuropraxia, axonotemesis, and neurotemesis, I will make the patient with neuropraxia go home and make the patient with axonotemesis go home. But patient with neurotemesis, it is our case for exploration. What is the tool for differentiation? It is the electrodiagnostic test. 
as both as professor dr hisham said we have two types of electrodiagnostic test emg and enog emg is voluntary volitional the patient is asked to do voluntary facial stimulation voluntary facial movement so it will call the resting activity and called and called voluntary or volitional activity volitional potential during normal there will be rest, no activity no resting activity but during volitional there will be biphasic or triphasic unit motor unit potential like the figure below type c it is triphasic potential it is a normal after trauma after acute insult immediately after acute insult the patient will lose the volitional potential but for fibrillation to occur and for sharp wave to occur it will take some time at least two weeks so within the first two weeks after trauma we will find absent volitional potential after two weeks there will be fibrillation and sharp wave during recovery the, again there will be no resting potential and there will be polyphasing motor unit potential so the figure below is type c it is the normal triphasic potential type e is the polyphasic potential which indicate recovery type b is the fibrillation potential type a is the fibrillation potential together with sharp wave so type a indicate degeneration type b indicate degeneration type c indicate normal activity type e indicate recovery EMG has two main limitation. It cannot done in the first three days for degeneration to occur, and it cannot predict the degree of degeneration. It just tell you that there is a fibrillation, indicate degeneration, but is it not ten percent degeneration, fifty percent degeneration, ninety percent degeneration? You cannot know the degree of degeneration from EMG only. The second test is the ENOG or evoked EMG. Evoked, so it means that there will be external stimulation. We test the facial nerve by stimulating the facial nerve as a stylomastoid foramen. So it will record the evoked potential, not the voluntary potential. So ENOG records the evoked potential, and it gives you a percentage of degeneration compared to the normal side. See, you can see this picture with the left side normal potential and the right side decrease amplitude of the potential by comparing the normal side to the disease side it will show that the amplitude is 80 percent indicating that 20 percent of the fiber show degeneration in the last picture the amplitude is seven percent from the normal side indicating that the, it, the, there is more than 90 percent degeneration so again in og is better than EMG by giving you the percentage of degeneration. But it has three limitations. The first one, it cannot be done after three day, before three days for degeneration to occur. And the other side must be normal because you compare the diseased one with the normal one. The main disadvantage of EMG is the deblocking effect, which Professor Dr. Hisham said. ENOG measures, measures the synchronization of the facial nerve fiber. You can see here the facial nerve fiber, H1 gives action potential, and ENOG measures the synchronization of this fiber. Suppose the patient have degeneration, so all fiber will not active, so it will give a flat curve. In the other, on the other hand, if the patient has regeneration, some fibers regenerated at different stages. So the, region, the regenerated fiber at different stages will give action potential at different stages. When you combine all of this, it will give a flat curve. So a flat curve in e on OG may indicate degeneration or regeneration. So E in OG cannot differentiate between degeneration and regeneration. So we must do complementary EMG. Again, if you find a case, with ENOG degeneration more than 90%, you have to do EMG to differentiate between is it degeneration or regeneration. And after 21 days, ENOG has no rule. 
degeneration already occurred. So E in OG has no value after 21 days and only you can do EMG. E in OG cannot predict recovery. If you have a case and you do a repair for that and you want to follow up the case, a follow up is only by EMG. E in OG cannot, different, cannot predict the regeneration. So it cannot be used for recovery. In summary, the E in OG measure the stimulated potential, while EMG measure resting and the voluntary potential. Within the first three days, E in OG and the EMG of no value. After three days to the 21 days, you have to do both of them. After 21 days, only you can do EMG. The E in OG can measure the percentage of degeneration while EMG gives you fibrillation, no motor unit potential. The E in OG has the advantage of being, give you precise indicator of the degree of degeneration while EMG cannot give you the precise degree of degeneration. The E in OG cannot be used for recovery and EMG can be used for recovery. That was an introduction. Now we will speak if we faced with a case like that. If we faced with a patient with traumatic facial palsy, what is your next step? You have to answer three question. I said that for our resident, if you have a case with traumatic facial palsy, you have to give me three main idea. Is this patient indication for surgery or not? What will be the approach? And what will, what will be the procedure? The first question, is this patient indicated for operation or conservation? To answer that, you must know the time of the facial policy. You must know the grade of the facial policy and you have to do electrodiagnosis. The time, if the patient developed immediate facial policy, it is a bad indicator. If the patient developed delayed facial policy after trauma, it is a good indicator. So patient with delayed facial palsy after trauma, mostly it is not complete nerve transection. Mostly it is neuropraxia or neurotemesis. You can, or axonotemesis, you can give him conservative management. But for cases with immediate facial palsy, you have to consider that point. Most of our cases will be after head trauma and the patient will be in the ICU and the patient cannot remember the, the time. Is it immediate or delayed? For unknown onset, it must be considered as immediate. If it's the first point, patient with immediate facial palsy. The second point is how is Brackman grading? All of us know how is Brackman grading. And as Professor Dr. Hisham said, I will focus on that point again. Don't rely on eye movement. For that case, you can see the video. This patient was complete eye closure. And if you, if you see this patient, you will give him a great fall. You can see the patient will close his eye completely. So you can give him great fall, facial nerve It is not great fall. This patient has complete facial balls, 100% degeneration. I will see you the e OG after one minute. 100% degeneration, but during examination, have complete eye closure. Don't rely on eye closure. Rely on ma and, and mouse and uh, forehead, not eye closure. So again, for patient with immediate complete facial palsy, I will do electrodiagnosis. During the first three days, nothing can be done. Nothing during the first three days. When the patient after three days, from the fourth day to the 21 day, you have to do both ENOG and EMG. Looking for what? Looking for more than 90% degeneration in ENOG together with, together with absent motor unit potential. If the patient has more than 90% degeneration and absent motor unit potential, it is the patient indicated for exploration. If there is less than 90% less than degeneration or some motor unit potential, this patient indicated for Conservation. Is the patient presented to you after 21 days, EMG only, no ENOG. Looking for what? Looking for fibrillation 
and sharp wave, this patient indicated for fibrillation, uh, absence of fibrillation or absence of sharp wave, this patient indicated for conservation. You, uh, again, patient with immediate, complete facial policy, this is our target, doing ENOG and EMG with both nine, more than 90% degeneration and absent motor unit potential in EMG. So we answer the first question, is this patient indicated for operation or not? The patient indicated for operation is the patient with immediate, complete, with ENOG more than 90% and absent potential in EMG. You have to fulfill all the four criteria. So the next question, what will be the approach? To decide the approach, you have to answer two questions. What is the site of injury? and what is the level of hearing. To know the site of injury, you have to do CT fine cuts, one millimeter fine cuts, coronal and axial. And to know the hearing, you have to do either butone or EBR according to the patient age. If the patient has non-serviceable hearing, so you can do trans lab, you can do even labyrinthectomy, and you can approach all the facial nerve from the labyrinthine segment to the, style, to the mastoid segment because the patient has non-serviceable hearing. But the problem, if the patient has some serviceable hearing, you have to identify the site of lesion. If the lesion is the mastoid segment or tympanic segment, you can do transmastoid and external auditory canal approach. If the lesion is the labyrinthine segment and genuclear ganglion, you have to do middle cranial fossa approach with or without transmastoid approach. Some example, this patient was fractal line this fracture line passing through the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, but also this fracture line passing through the inner ear. So we expect that the case has dead ear and the cut will be in the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Other case with transverse fracture, with longitudinal fracture passing through the mastoid and then passing through the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. This case was fracture passing towards the genuclear ganglion, expected to require immediate cranial force approach. The last question to answer, we answered two questions. The first question to operate or not. To operate, we have to have immediate, complete facial policy with ENOG more than 90% and absent EMG potential. The approach depends on the CT and the hearing, and finally the procedure. If the facial nerve intraoperatively found to be intact, you have to decompress with or without incision of the nerve sheath. There is a controversy to incise the sheath or not. If the facial nerve is cut and the two end can be approximated, you can do neurophy. If the, there is a gap between the two ends of the facial nerve, you have to do you have to use nerve graft for a small gap. You can use the great ocular nerve for large gap you can use the sure and nerve graft. So this was about traumatic or accidental facial nerve trauma. What about iatrogenic facial nerve trauma? Iatrogenic facial nerve trauma follows the same rules. You have to answer the three questions, to operate or not, and what will be the approach, and what will be the procedure. To operate or not, again, immediate complete facial policy is our concern. In incomplete or delayed facial policy after surgery is not indication for surgery. It indicated for follow-up. Immediate complete, you have to wait for six hours for the effect of the local anesthesia. I have seen many cases for canal will up mastoidectomy, canal will down mastoidectomy, stabidectomy, with low, just effect of local anesthesia and causing immediate complete facial policy. And after four hours, the patient completely recovered. If the patient after six hours still have complete facial policy and the surgeon is expert and confident of facial nerve integrity, you can follow up the patient with daily ENOG. On the other hand, if the surgeon is unconfident or it was a difficult pathology or a difficult anatomy, and you are in the first three days, you can do EMG looking, looking for absent potential. And in such a case, you can explore. Or after three days, you can you have to do ENOG and EMG 
looking looking for more than 90% generation and absent motor neuron potential. So for iatrogenic cases to oxidlo again, the case must be immediate, complete after at least four hours for the effect of local anesthesia and doing EMG or EMG and ENOG. It will follow the same as traumatic. The approach will be the same doing the CT and hearing, and the procedure will be the same just for intact nerve or, or cut nerve. Some case scenario in Tanta University Hospital. This is patient with right side facial palsy after applying our rule. For sure, this patient has some movement in the right face. You will see some, move, some movement in the eyebrow. You can see some movement in the forehead. And of course, some movement in the nasolabial fold. So this patient with partial facial nerve palsy. It is not an indication for surgery or doing anything, just follow up. To be confident about that, this patient did ENOG and it will find to have just 20% generation. And you can see the fracture line in, that, in, in such a case, this fracture line. Another case, this patient was left side facial palsy. Most of our cases, again, don't rely on eye closure. Most of our cases are in the ICU, so the patient is not focused and not confident. And the surgeon and the resident was not confident about examination. So the resident asked for ENOG and it, would, and it was found to be less than 10% degeneration. The last case, this patient with left side facial palsy. Again, as Dr. Professor Hisham Mohammed said, you have to do, you have to prevent transmission between both sides and don't rely on eye closure. This patient with eye closure, but grade six facial palsy. The first question is to operate or not. This patient was immediate and complete. And the ENOG showing complete degeneration, the motor unit potential and complete degeneration. What is the approach for decision for the approach? We did a CT and the coronal CT. You can see this is the facial nerve, and you can see the fracture line here affecting the mastoid segment of the facial. And this is a fracture line affecting the mastoid segment of the facial and extend to the style of mastoid foramen. This is a fracture line in coronal cuts. And in the axial cuts, this is a fracture line. You can see the fracture line mostly affecting the mastoid segment. And the fracture line extended to the jugular foramen. So we expect here in such a case to find that the jugular vein may be injured in such a case. But fortunately, the fracture line does not extend to the carotid canal. If the fracture line extends to the carotid canal, you have to do, to do CT angio, even angiography, because sometimes the fracture line extends to the carotid canal and intraoperatively, the carotid will blow out. For, for decision of the approach, the fracture line in the mastoid segment and the hearing is serviceable, so this patient will undergo transmastoid facial decompression. For atrogenic case, such a case with large CB angle lesion, large CB angle acoustic neuroma, this patient underwent labyrinthectomy for CB angle to tumor excision done by Professor Dr. Hisham and me and the uh, new surgeon, Professor Dr. Ashraf Farid. After completion of the surgery, after excision of the tumor, the patient has partial facial. For sure there is some movement of the forehead and for sure there is some movement of the eye. So it is not complete and not immediate. It is delayed after one day and partial. So the decision was conservation 
And this is the same case after two weeks during removal of the eye bandage, ear bandage, for sure there is some eye movement. Uh, and after three months, this patient returned completely to normal. Conclusion, the most important factor during approaching cases with traumatic facial palsy are the time and the degree. Delayed or incomplete facial paralysis is better observed with a very high chance for spontaneous recovery. Only immediate and complete paralysis must be considered for electrodiagnosis. Electrodiagnosis can be done after three days. ENOG with more than 90% degeneration and the EMG with no motor unit potential are the indication for exploration. For iatrogenic insult, please wait for four hours to exclude the effect of anesthesia. For optimum surgical result, exploration and to, uh, surgical treatment must be done within the first two weeks. Decision for the approach depends upon localization of the site of the trauma and the healing. Intraoperatively, you have to be ready either for uh, decompression or using the nerve graft. It is better to have EMG facial nerve monitoring intraoperatively to confirm the site of injury. And after, at the end of my lecture, I want to remind you for tumbal bone fracture, there may be associated inner ear trauma, tympanic membrane trauma, ocular trauma, Berlin fistula, CSA fistula, vascular insult. Don't forget that and focus on the facial nerve only. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Ayman, for this very nice presentation. And uh, now we come to the discussion. So uh, I, I will ask uh, all the speakers to unmute to, so they can answer. Dr. Mahmoud, unmute. Let's see the questions we We have a question. We have a question here. Uh, what are the landmark for lowering the facial ridge during canal wall down mastoidectomy to avoid injury of the mastoid uh, vertical segment of the facial nerve? Any tips or tricks of where to stop lowering? And, uh, the question: uh, the landmark for lowering the facial ridge. Uh, I have a comment on such. Uh, uh, do you mean intraoperative landmark or do you mean a preoperative prediction of the landmark? Because I have some point, as I said, if you read the CT preoperatively and you can uh, predict the type of the facial nerve. For example, if the mastoid part of the facial nerve is emerging at the same coronal level, for example, of the posterior limb of the superior or the lateral semicircular canal. And if you find that it is lateral or medial to the most uh, lateral point of the doom, so in such case, my landmark will be the doom of the lateral semicircular canal because I'm sure that along the way down to the stylomastoid forming, there is no fissure. The fissure is medial to this plane. So I can lower the fissure ridge down to the doom of the lateral canal, even at the lower part, okay? And this is the importance of the radiology. In predicting of course the classical surgical is at the upper part or at the superior part you have to lower the ridge down to the tomb of the lateral semicircular canal then as you go downward or inferiorly you have to leave more pun because the facial has a lateral uh, position or have a lateral uh, uh, journey from the uh, tomb of the lateral semicircular canal to the spinal mastoid forum but as i have just said this is the classical surgical landmark but if you can predict the site of the mastoid part of the facial nerve because as i've just said the most lateral part of the facial nerve is the inferior part of the mastoid segment so if the mastoid if the lower part of the mastoid part of the facial segment as it emerges from the stylomastoid foramen is medial to the plane of the doom so i can go to lower the facial ridge very safely and i have been, this is a favorable condition but if you have the mastoid part of the facial nerve lateral to the most lateral point of the lateral semicircular canal. In such a case, no, I have to be more careful 
I have to lower it at the superior part down to the lateral. But as I go downward, I will be very, very careful because I'm no, I know that the fissure nerve is more lateral, if, especially if it's more than two millimeter lateral to the lateral semicircular canal. And this is the importance of the 3D imagining of the fissure nerve in relation to the lateral. But the most important landmark to imagine the fissure nerve is the lateral semicircular canal. دكتور دكتور فتحي أو دكتور شاب عايزك تحب ت ت ت تقول حاجة يفهم يا حسام the question the question can the question can إن إحنا وإحنا بنعمل lowering للفيشر ريج what are the landmarks for lowering the fissure ridge during surgery during uh, canal roll down, I think uh, the question is there. It is the lateral is uh, lateral semi canal dome is very crucial, and the canal roll down you can combine it with the uh, knowing the position of the fissure nerve from the uh, tympanic part, the horizontal part. You know, uh, third, uh, there are some uh, tricks you can help you. Uh, at first, think of the fisher as a friend, not as an enemy. Uh, if you think it's an enemy, you will uh, try to avoid it and we lose the anatomy. But as a friend, you can expect the inside and avoid it. Let us say, it is always medial, as as, professor, as Dr. Haysam uh, explained in his uh, presentation of anatomy, it is medial and anterior to the lateral, to the lateral semicircular canal. Uh, a continuation of the course from the tympanic part to the mastoid segment is different. When you approach the fissure nerve, usually the air, the, the air cells disappear and it starts to be uh, white, the, the bone with the, with the drilling. So even you can, the sound of the uh, bear differs in that time. So you can expect it by the sound of the bear, you know. Uh, uh, of course, the two, more, the second, site which you can injure is the uh, is the uh, is the uh, digastric ridge usually remember that a fissure nerve is uh, turns lateral as a lower part of the mastoid it becomes lateral it is a common site to injure the fissure nerve in this site for experience usually experienced surgeon, surgeon injures the fissure nerve uh, as a sign of mastoid foramen but uh, beginners injury the fissure nerve at uh, the second genome. So it is a matter of anatomy. Uh, if you know the anatomy, and uh, you can, uh, of course, the bleeding, the bleeding sign is again when you approach the fissure nerve. Uh, if you start to to have bleeding, this means the fissure nerve is very rich in uh, in vascular supply. And when you approach it, you start to have bleeding. So this will. Uh, Help you to avoid injuring the fissure nerve. I don't know whether Dr. Fatah wants to add something or not. Dr. Fatah, Dr. Fatah, how do you have it? As Professor Rishan said, uh, in the lower part of the mastoid, the, the nerve is too much lateral. So uh, the digestive ridge is bleeding, as Professor Rishan stated. Uh, of course, in the tympanic part and the upper part of the mastoid, the doom of the lateral semicircular canal is a good landmark, uh, and the pyramid is a good landmark uh, for lowering the uh, fascia. But be careful. Uh, we have another question from uh, here. Uh, could you do stabidotomy safely in type 4? May I add something important? Oh, Usually, injury of the fissure nerve may mean to the trauma. It's a, a, a mechanical trauma, what I mean. Uh, it's, thermal trauma is very important. So when, when you approach the fissure nerve, you, ha you have to have copious uh, irrigation. So the fissure nerve may be injured from the you, 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 from, from thermal trauma, not from the mechanical injury itself. Just, uh, oh, so uh, I want to stress something. There. What happened? This is what happened with me. I have, I have two. Uh, during my career, I have, I had two uh, fissure nerve, uh, hydrogenic fissure nerve paralysis, 
from uh, mastoidectomy. <clears throat> Uh, the first one, uh, I, I remember that Dr. Hisham Hamad, our professor, who came to, to explore the, the, the case afterward. The first one, uh, it was cortical mastoidectomy. I, I had uh, facial, the patient had complete facial paralysis post-operative. And then I decided to uh, explore the patient again. While trying to explore the facial nerve, I opened the lateral semicircular canal. This is very, very important to, to know the, the, the relation of the facial nerve to the lateral semicircular canal. Usually when you are trying to explore the, 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 this area of the genu, uh, you may open the dome of the lateral semicircular canal. So this patient, fortunately, uh, the facial nerve was uh, recovered again after three months after exploration. But unfortunately, because we all, I opened the lateral semicircular canal, the patient uh, had uh, severe sense of neural in this uh, side. The second case, it was a canal wall down. And uh, uh, I remember that the facial nerve was completely intact because I remember seeing the tympanic part and the vertical part and the genu it was canal wall down. So we lowered everything and the facial nerve was exposed. But it was thermal trauma, as uh, Professor uh, Dr. Hisham said, uh, for the part just above the, the foot plate of stabis, it was the dehiscent part. And uh, from uh, the thermal trauma, it was uh, is a patient that had fish, complete facial paralysis. And uh, it, it uh, uh, recovered in three months. After three months, the patient was completely uh, cured. So uh, uh, let's go to other questions. This is a question from uh, Dr. Mohammed. Could, could you do stabidotomy safely in type 4 facial nerve positioning? Could you do stabidotomy safely in type 4 facial nerve positioning? <coughs> may, I, may, I, may I answer, Dr. Hussam? This is very, very rare. First point. Second point, uh, you know, if the food blade is accessible to you, you go ahead and do subidotomy, no problem. Uh, sometimes if it is dehiscent and you can dis dislocate or shift it without uh, too much trauma, you can go uh, and do subidotomy. The problem with the facial nerve is occluding the uh, oval window. This is a pr real problem. Uh, uh, I agree with Dr. Hisham that it's a rare condition, but uh, you, uh, in my opinion, it depends on the integrity of the fallopia canal. If you type four fissure nerve is the hissing fissure nerve, it will be difficult. Yes, the foot plate is accessible, but at the step of fracturing the foot plate or of the fracturing the crura of the stabies, and ex uh, extracting the stabies, I think it will compromise the fissure nerve. But if you find the fallopian canal intact and the bone over it intact, yes, I will proceed easily and safely. But if I find the fissure nerve dehiscent, I think that it needs an expert surgeon to do it finely without and to manipulate the stabies finally without compromising the fissure nerve. <laughs> the same as they said. It's very rare, I have never seen it. Tur Aiban, Tur Haysam, Dukum. That's the same. I, if, if, if anyone sees this patient, tell me. Abort, I think sense. it never seen. <laughs> it never seen. <laughs> okay, another question uh, <laughs> for Dr. Haysam from where you get the pictures in your presentation. I think he answered I that. I answered that. Uh, really, uh, uh, very nice pictures. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and this is very important, very important to do cadaveric dissection and uh, to, to drill the temporal bone completely. I, I have to say that uh, it's very important to understand the anatomy, to go uh, and drill. When you see the complete course of the facial nerve and uh, do dissection of the whole facial nerve, it's very, uh, you will never forget. For Dr. Uh, Mahmoud, a question for Dr. Mahmoud Mandur. Uh, do you have an imaging modality to trace the extracranial intraparotid facial nerve with confidence? Yeah, actually, uh, to be honest, I am not uh, that interested in the extracranial part of the facial nerve, but I have read some reports recently about the use of the three Tesla 
MRI, heavily weighted T2, like CISS or 3D Viesta, and also for the flat 3D MRI planner technique. Uh, I see very nice pictures, but actually I don't know if such techniques has been uh, practiced in such way here in Egypt or not. Uh, but of course, it will be more difficult than tracing it in the temporal lagoon, of course. Any, any comment from, uh, from uh, our professors about the extra cranial part of uh, the face shield? So we have another question here. The role of physiotherapy in post-traumatic facial nerve palsy. Is it mandatory? What is the best time to be uh, done by the patient? Physiotherapy in post-traumatic facial nerve paralysis. Uh, Dr. Ayman, I think. Uh, uh, as, as Professor Dr. Hasham said, in the early stage, there is no role for physiotherapy. But for chronic cases, and there will be uh, degen uh, degenerated fish and nerve muscle for a long time, there will be fish muscles that will undergo fibrosis and um, loss of motor unit. But, uh, loss of motor unit. Sometimes we have a fish and nerve, but the muscles are too fine. So in the chronic cases, you have to do physiotherapy to guard against muscle atrophy. But for acute insult, you, you, uh, you, uh, physiotherapy is the um, choice. But for chronic cases, it, it is a must to guard against atrophy of the muscle fiber. The chronic cases, yani how much uh, time? How much? For, for cases expected to mm -hmm. recover more than three months. Mm -hmm. Because if the muscle fiber does not gain Can I add something? motor unit activity for more than one year, it will undergo fibrosis mm -hmm. and atrophy. Mm -hmm. I think the patient will will have unmute <laughs> 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 The therapy is usually asked by the by others that uh, who are treating your your patient. Uh, if they have a surgeon or if a medical, or so will will do a physiotherapy. Even if you stress to the patient of the significance of physiotherapy, I think most of them will not obey you, and most of them will go and have a physiotherapy. Uh, uh, I, I respect uh, Dr. Ayman's comments, but usually if you ask him to stop physiotherapy, uh, uh, you are fighting against the stream because the neurosurgeon asks for physiotherapy, the physiotherapist asks for physiotherapy, then my medicine asks for physiotherapy. So why, why, why you are the only one uh, stressing that it is, you know, if the patient did not improve, I think he will be removed. So do your part and uh, see what's what patient is weighing you or not. Dr. Hussam, can I add something? No, I think we have to uh, yeah, divide it into three stages. During the acute stage, which is about uh, one week to three weeks, uh, it is harmful. It encourages... Uh, uh, cross reintegration and uh, synchronesis and uh, after the acute stage it is useless but uh, in prolonged cases as uh, Dr. Ayman said it is useful to keep the muscle viable till we plan uh, till we plan for, uh, for uh, rehabilitative surgery you know so uh, we cannot, the neurosurgeon usually advise a patient to go for, uh, or other doctors advise a patient to go for physiotherapy. It is okay you, after the acute stage, although it is not beneficial. And it is a must in the chronic stage. But the acute stage, we have to insist there is no value, but it is harmful. 
to ask the patient to go for, for the physiotherapy during the acute stage. This is a message which has to be conducted to other doctors and other physicians. And even, uh, I, I'm sure, even uh, our friends in, physio, uh, uh, in physical medicine, uh, they also ask the patient to go for physiotherapy. This is not evident for them, not clear for them. And so we, we move to the other question from Dr. Muhammad Al-Adi. An extensive unsafe chronic ear eroding the fallopian canal, getting the mastoid segment of the facial uh, beard. Uh, what to do and how to cover? Is it better to cover it with bone dust or cartilage? Again, the question again, Dr. Hussam. Uh, an extensive unsafe chronic ear eroding the fallopian canal, getting the mastoid segment of the facial beard. Official, uh, and the essence or facial uh, exposed. Uh, what to do and how to cover it? Is it better to cover it with bone, dust, or cartilage? Can I answer? 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 والبون داست ممكن يعمل unexpected new osteogenesis it's better to cover it with a temporalis fascia only or a brachondrium but not bone dust and also not a cartilage I, I don't think we need to cover it at all yes I think it is I don't think we don't need to cover it at all if it is intact and functioning you know uh, the, the just one point I want to stress if you are going to do a compression in chronic ear and the facial nerve was found to be intact. So don't open the sheath, keep the sheath. Mm. Maybe, in, uh, as Ayman said, Dr. Ayman said, in traumatic, you can open the sheath, but to relieve edema, but in chronic, don't open the sheath. But you don't need to cover it if, it, uh, if it's exposed and functioning, you know, and intact, what I mean. Uh, here we have a question from Dr. Tamir Abid. Uh, nice topic. Any role for intraoperative facial nerve monitoring? Any role for intraoperative facial nerve monitoring? If you have it, if you have it, use it. Uh, any any uh, any role for intraoperative facial nerve monitoring in traumatic cases? I would like to hear from Tanta School Experience. Thank you. And do you use the nerve monitoring? Yeah. Can I answer? Uh, during uh, the first two weeks, the facial nerve is still, during the first few days, the facial nerve is still intact, even in complete cut. So if the facial nerve is intact, even within complete cut, the distal segment is still stimulated. And, and intraoperative facial nerve monitoring will be beneficial. In some cases, you cannot find the distal segment. And you can localize the distal segment of the facial nerve using facial nerve stimulation intraoperatively. So in the first days or first five days, some facial nerve is still intact to be stimulated, even in complete transection. After that, there is no value because the facial nerve underwent degeneration and it, it will not stimulated by the facial nerve monitor. So it is beneficial only in the first three to four days. If you explore the patient in the first three to four days, use facial nerve monitoring. If after that, it is of no value. Uh, the, the question also about the use of uh, facial nerve monitoring in, uh, in mastoid surgery and CI cases. Do you use the nerve, the facial nerve monitoring in mastoid and the CI cases in Tanta? Uh, uh, can I answer? Uh, I, I was in Stanford, USA. It is a must. <laughs> and medical legal in Stanford. They use it in every case, even for cases with external duty canal stioma. They use the facial nerve monitoring. But I think in, in Egypt, it's not applicable. <laughs> But uh, uh, I can assure with Ayman that the U in the US it is for medical purpose, but they don't depend on it. They depend mainly on the experience. Yes, I, I'm agree with the use. 
It is a flammated use. Can I add something, Dr. Osama? Yes, please. In the Western world, the use is medical legally. Medical legally only. I think this is waste of time. This is waste of money. You know? You know? So no need at all. And sometimes Dr. Osama gives false results too. Yes. Exactly. Yes, it, 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 it keep alarming and you are away. So it is, it is the knowing anatomy is irreversible, even if you have uh, efficient nerve monitoring. Yes. Uh, it's like uh, the navigation in uh, endoscopic science. Like the navigation. We look for medical legal uh, aspect, but we never uh, depend on the navigation itself. Of, of course, in some situation, we might need the efficient nerve. But by that time, you have to develop, as uh, as Dr. Haysam said, it keeps uh, giving you false alarm. Yes. If you are not acquainted to the using the fission nerve, you when you need it, 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 it will be. It's, uh, you are in a trouble, خلاص. So you, you are in a trouble. You need it, you are in a trouble. So yeah. I, I, I advise if you have a fission nerve monitoring to use it routinely in muscle surgery for some time till someone gets the experience with it and after that it's not important you know and and don't rely on it rely on the knowing the anatomy more on the fish and nerve uh, lastly we have questions about bill's policy uh, from dr amr said role of vasodilators and neurotonics role of vasodilators and the neurotonics in management of Bell's policy? No, there is no evidence for uh, their uh, effect uh, at all. They are useless. You know, the most uh, approved uh, medical therapy for Bell's policy, as I said in my uh, presentation, is that steroid alone or steroid plus antiviral. Mm -hmm. Even antiviral alone is not beneficial as a mono therapy. بالظبط دي تعتبر الإجابة بتاعت دكتورة زهرة، دكتورة زهرة بتقول وات از ذا بيست مانجمنت فور ايديوباسيك فيشن نيرف بوليسي حضرتك جاوبته بالفعل اللي هو الستيرويدز مع مع الأنتي فايرال. كده احنا ذيس از ذا اند اوف اور كويشنز. اني بادي اني ون اوف ذا سبيكرز وود لايك تو اد سمثينج فور ذا ذيس نايس توبيك. ثانك يو. We thank you in particular for this nice, uh, nice um, organization, <laughs> and uh, we all grateful for you for for for, uh, for, for that.